Johnny Erickson Tata is the founder and CEO of Johnny and Friends International Disability Center, an international advocate for people with disabilities. A diving accident in 1967 left Johnny Erickson, then 17, a quadriplegic in a wheelchair. After two years of rehab, she emerged with new skills and a fresh determination to help others in similar situations. <clears throat> She founded Johnny and Friends in 1979 to provide Christ-centered ministry to special needs families, as well as training for churches. Johnny and Friends serves thousands of special needs families through family retreats and has delivered over 170,000 wheelchairs and Bibles to needy individuals with disabilities in developing nations. Johnny survived stage three breast cancer in 2010 yet keeps a very active schedule. She is an author, editor, and artist. She and her husband, Ken, were married in 1982 and reside in Calabasas, California. Due to the reoccurrence of her cancer, she is currently undergoing treatment and she's unable to travel. She was gracious enough to prepare a special message for us today, which will be on the screens. So join me in watching Johnny Erickson Tata. Thank you, dear friends, for inviting me to share a brief message here in chapel this morning when um, Pastor Joe Allen invited me to speak here at Dallas Theological Seminary today. I, I did not know that I'd be in a new battle against cancer, but my cancer treatment, as well as my battle against chronic pain, has made it um, extremely difficult to travel by airplane right now. And so, uh, me here in my art studio talking to you this way this morning, we'll just have to do. But um, before I share my message about reaching people with disabilities for Christ, I just want to take a couple of minutes to address this new cancer that I'm dealing with. Maybe some of you know, I don't know, maybe not. I battled stage three cancer eight years ago, but now it has come back and it is faster growing and it is more aggressive. So I am expecting radiation treatment that will be just as aggressive. I'm preparing for that right now, but you know what, that's okay. I thank God for great radiologists and oncologists. Most of all, I thank God for his wisdom and his grace. And that is what has troubled a couple of brothers and sisters in Christ, friends of mine. I've received a couple of emails from these friends and they have hinted that God is putting me through too much nearly 52 years of quadriplegia, chronic pain for nearly 25 years, my previous cancer, and now this new one? I don't know, maybe you would agree that God is putting me through too much, and I guess if I let my own thoughts wander, I might say the same. Rather than doing me good, it could appear as though God were harming me, and I cannot blame these friends for feeling that way. It's quite natural. And that is what is troubling. Christians should know better. Such feelings are dangerous because they are natural. They reveal what these people really think about God. And it is not very exalting, let alone true. Plus, those confessions that God is perhaps doing me more harm than good show that a lot of believers do not understand what the Bible says about suffering. For instance, some would say, Johnny, there are countless references telling us that God does no harm to his children, only good. There is Jeremiah chapter 32, verse 41, where God himself says, quote, I will find joy in doing good for them. Then there's Psalm 84, verse 11. You all know that well. The Lord will not withhold any good thing from those who walk and do what is right. And perhaps the most famous one is Jeremiah 29, verse 11. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans to do you good and not to harm you, to give you future and a hope. These are great verses, and there are countless others just like them in the Bible. God only intends good for his children, so. Why would God allow so much chronic pain, my quadriplegia, my cancer, and now this new, more aggressive cancer? Well, simply this, God is less interested in my physical well-being 
and he's so much more interested in strengthening my soul. And I love that. Yes, painful hardships are the dark driving rain of God's sovereignty. They don't happen by accident. And yes, those difficult things hurt and harm my body. But the sunshine of God's sovereignty is the good that is being done in my soul through it all, and I wouldn't trade it for anything. The depth of faith, the scarred but seasoned wisdom, my unshakable peace, the heavy, happy conviction of soul, the unwavering devotion to my wonderful Savior who also suffered, and the ironclad trust that comes from walking through the valley of the shadow of death. Oh my goodness. And the really good stuff that comes out of suffering is that it supports your testimony. All this supports my witness and convinces skeptics and unbelievers that God is really worth trusting. Jesus is ecstasy beyond compare, and it's worth anything to be his friend. And when they see you smile through the toughest of pain, as people see me do, I think it shames unbelievers and proves beyond a doubt that God's grace is able to sustain. So those Bible verses I mentioned a moment ago, like um, when God says the plans I have for you are for good and not to harm you, God's talking about doing good for my soul, the kind of good that prepares you for heaven, that enlarges your eternal estate, the kind of good that stretches your capacity to, yes, even suffer more. God is talking about good that validates, that verifies your testimony. This is what he is after, and it's why we can trust him. And yes, he may harm your body, but never your soul. And if you disagree, thinking that suffering only makes you complain and worry and become anxious or embittered, then friend, you are not appropriating the grace that God makes available. You don't have to complain. None of us as Christians have to complain or be bitter. For one thing, Philippians chapter 2, verse 14 says, not to complain about anything. Anything? Well, the Bible says it's possible, doesn't it? So there's available power to enable you to trust and hold fast to the Lord Jesus. There's available power to help you be courageous, to make your soul brave, for that's the good God is talking about in those precious Bible verses. And there's certainly no harm in that, is there? <laughs> oh, and if someone is tempted to say, well, then God is using a different dictionary because that's not my idea of good, then it's just proof that his thoughts are higher than yours. Too many Christians not only have a low idea of God, but a low idea of what's good. When I quote Psalm 84 and Jeremiah 29, those verses are just the Holy Spirit's way of elevating our thinking, of seeing what's good from God's point of view. So um, I just had to share all of that since receiving those emails from my Christian friends, the ones with questions. Anyway, thank you for letting me get this out. Thank you for praying for me as I get ready to uh, do some aggressive radiation to eradicate, Lord willing, all this cancer. And you've got to know, okay, as far as my message goes, you got to know I'm passionate about these sorts of things. I'm passionate about other people who suffer. I'm passionate about the words of Jesus from Luke chapter 14, where he says, when you give a banquet, do not invite your friends or your brothers or relatives. If you do, they may invite you back and so you will be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you're gonna be blessed. It's not many places that Jesus gets that specific about the exact sort of people he once invited into his kingdom, but of all the people you might overlook, do not neglect, do not overlook people with disabilities. Break out of the comfort zone of your friends and your brothers and your relatives and your rich neighbors, you know, people that you identify with, and reach out to people with disabilities, special needs families. Do it, and you'll be blessed. So just how is the church blessed? by inviting in people with disabilities and their families? Well, I think of my friend Carla Larson. Titus chapter two, verse seven says, in everything set them an example by doing what is good. Let me tell you about Carla and how she fits that verse. I met her when I went to one of our family retreats that we hold at Johnny and Friends. There are five days of hands down slam dunk fun and fellowship for special needs families and times in the Word of God, times of prayer and counseling one-on-one, -on -one, 
great fun, wheelchair dancing, wheelchair swimming, wheelchair hiking, all kinds of things. And I was going through the registrations and I looked at one registration, it was about this woman, Carla, who had signed up for retreat. She, she had uh, both her legs removed. She had most of her fingers gone on her hands. She had suffered three heart attacks, had lost one kidney, had severe edema, constant angioplasties, was uh, legally blind. And I thought, oh my goodness, I gotta meet this woman. So I tracked her down on the campus. And I said, Carla, I'm so amazed that you were able to make it to family retreat. At which point she said, well, Johnny, I thought I'd better come to your family retreat before I lost any more body parts. <laughs> Obviously, Carla had not lost her sense of humor. And she was such an inspiration to all of us, such an example to all of us there at that family retreat. And she loved it. When she got home, she sent me a thank you note, except the note was twist tied to one of her toes on an old prosthetic foot. And when I read the note, it said, Dear Johnny, since all of me cannot be with all of you all of the time, part of me is gonna to have to do. <laughs> Amazing woman she is. She inspired courage in people at that family retreat just by, just by being there, just by smiling, just by showing up in the midst of her disability, just by getting up and facing the day, just by arriving. And in the church, people who suffer greater conflict always have something to say to those who suffer less conflict. And Carla and those like her are powerful examples. They have a blessed message for the church. God has not redeemed us to make our lives happy or healthy or free of trouble. God has redeemed us to make us more like Jesus Christ. Because life is hard. Just ask any quadriplegic. Oh my goodness, when I wake up in the morning facing what? 52 years of quadriplegia, there are so many times, most days, I think, I can't do this. I am so tired of this. I have no strength or energy or resources for this. I cannot do quadriplegia one more day. But I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. My suffering is like a sheepdog snapping at my heels, driving me every morning to the cross of Jesus Christ by the overwhelming conviction that I just ain't got anywhere else to go. I have such great needs, and Jesus is the one who meets them. So yes, life is hard for any quadriplegic, or any parent of a child with special needs, or any young man with cerebral palsy who lives in a dreary care facility. But theirs is the power of example, reminding us all that our life-altering hardships do have a place, an important place, in anyone's walk with Christ because those hardships will drive you to Jesus. They'll press you up against the breast of your Savior out of desperate need. And that's what Jesus wants in the Beatitudes, what? Um, in Matthew chapter five, Jesus said the very first Beatitude, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. In other words, blessed are you when you come to me in empty-handed spiritual poverty, for then the kingdom of heaven is yours. We can't do anything without Jesus Christ. Without him, we can do nothing. And our hardships remind us of that every day. And people with disabilities remind us that although Jesus has saved us from suffering in hell, he has not saved us from suffering on earth. That's a message that the church sometimes forgets. But observing the daily hardships that special needs families go through, it can strengthen the church. And that's such a big blessing. There's another way, way that the church is blessed, and it has to do with something that Jesus said the day he died. I want you to imagine that with me just for a moment. In your mind, go back 2,000 years and picture yourself standing at the foot of the cross that late, stormy, dark Friday afternoon when Jesus was crucified. Picture it, imagine yourself there. Do you see yourself huddling with that small group at the foot of the cross? It's drizzling, and you wipe away tears and rain from your face, but you're keeping your eyes on Jesus up there on the cross. There he is, and suddenly you see him. His head drops against the crossbar, and you hear him groan, Oh, I am thirsty. I thirst. Now, open your eyes, stop imagining. What do you see yourself doing? 
Certainly you're not about to give him a sponge soaked in vinegar. No, this is Jesus. This is the savior of the world who's come to save you. I mean, like me, you probably picture yourself springing into action. Get a hose, dig a well, find a bucket of water, run back to town and get Jesus uh, an ice cold glass of lemonade, anything to quench the thirst of your Lord. He is saying that he's thirsty and you can do something about it. But history is written. It's not 2000 years ago and now you are helpless to do anything. Or are you? Because there is still Matthew chapter 25 where the king says to his followers, quote, I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. And the righteous will answer, Lord, when did we see you thirsty? When did we give you something to drink? And the king will reply, I tell you the truth. Whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. So history can be rewritten. We can make a difference. We can still give Jesus that drink. And special needs ministry is a very personal way of directly serving the Lord Jesus and giving him that drink because they are the least of the brethren they are. And serving Jesus sacrificially, oh my goodness, that happens all the time when you help a person with a disability like me. Because you see, while God's love for us is unconditional, our experience of his love is not. You gotta keep giving his love away in order to keep experiencing it. And we experience Christ's love in its fullness when our service costs us something, when it's hard. Special needs ministry can be demanding. It can be very hard, but that's to the church's advantage. It requires a congregation to get immersed in others, just as Christ has done for us because you can't serve among people with disabilities at a, at a safe arm's length distance, untouched, unscathed. Disability ministry is gonna keep your church from looking like another um, Emily Post Picture Perfect institution, all neat and normal, all regulated and rule keeping. Now disability ministry keeps the church messy and cluttered and needy and dependent on God. It requires the full immersion of a congregation not a special needs department that's segregated or separated off to the side. No, it's not even about inclusion or mainstreaming. It's about belonging. People with disabilities want to know if they don't come to your church, they're missed. It's about belonging, it's about family, the family of God that misses each other. For the eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, as it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, quote, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. You know, that verse is best illustrated by my friend Charlene. Um, an unexpected neuromuscular condition forced her into a hospital where she had to have someone give her a bed bath and catheterize her. And she had to do her toileting routines on a bedpan. She had to be fed by somebody else. After she got out of the hospital, she said to me, Johnny, I don't know how you do that. People feed you all the time and do your toileting routines, and I, I, I could never do it if I were you. And I had to laugh. I said the same to her. I said, Charlene, that's so funny because I could never do what you do. You see, my friend Charlene is deaf and blind. And you would probably say the same. We all think we could never survive without our, without our eyesight, without our hearing. We just couldn't live without use of our hands or our legs. But Charlene and I proved that people do it every single day. None of these parts that are showy and upfront are indispensable. None is critical to the life and vitality of the body. But let me tell you what the body can't live without. You can't live without your kidneys. You can't live without your lungs, your pancreas. These body parts may seem uncomely as some translations say, unattractive, homely even. And they're usually neglected or ignored or go unnoticed, but they are absolutely critical to the life and vitality of the body. And it's why the church needs liver kinds of ladies and kidney kinds of guys. The church needs pancreatic people, people with disabilities and their families. These people are absolutely critical to the health and the life and vitality of the body of Christ. They may seem to be weaker, 
as it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. But they are the secret to God's strength on display in any church. And it's why I'm glad I can speak to you who are stuttering, studying for the pastorate or a degree in biblical counseling or Christian education. When God calls you to that church or to that mission field or to that institution, would you please go out, find the disabled and bring them in, do it, and the church will be built up, edified, and blessed. The church will become the church. So get involved in our WM905 Beyond Suffering course uh, here at DTS, where you can take it online and then come serve at one of our Johnny and Friends family retreats. The cost of both is covered by your tuition. So sign up for the course and get engaged and join the global movement to exalt the Lord Jesus by promoting a biblical worldview of suffering, such as I mentioned at the top, and reaching some of the neediest people on earth, those that other, others forget, those with disabilities. I hope our time together has been a blessing. Really, I do. Sorry I can't be there with you, but I hope that I've conveyed my heart and my passion to you, my dear friends at Dallas Theological Seminary this morning. Thank you for listening. Thank you for caring. Thank you for following the mandate of Jesus in Luke 14. Go out, find the disabled, and bring them in.